everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, or wherever it may be, wherever you are currently sitting in front of your computer or at the Manners Conference. Manners 2021. This part of our presentation is all about you deciding to work with us. Come work with us as we share some information about US Department, the US Department of Agriculture, APHIS. Now, what is APHIS? Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. That's right, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services. Every animal, every plant coming in and out of this United States of America has to have some type of way to stay safe. So we're protecting America's agriculture and natural resources, and that's our mission. So we've been doing this for quite some time. But now that is a huge job for a lot of people. As a matter of fact, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service has over 8,400 employees. As you can see, 8,470 right now. Positions all across the United States and globally to keep our agriculture and our natural resources safe. All right, now we have a $1.7 billion budget and that's a lot of money, right? But when you think about it, it's a lot of places. So everywhere that a bug could travel or anywhere that a leaf can grow, we're involved. We have six operational programs that we're really, really keyed in on. And we're gonna talk about all six. Of them. As a matter of fact, I've invited a few panelists to kind of share with you why this is a great place to work. Now, APHIS has so many different other things that we can't talk about today, but we're really gonna focus in on plant health and what we do to secure the health of our plants. We're also gonna talk about animal health, because you know, when an animal uh, comes in or out of this country, we, don't, we wanna make sure that they're safe, right? We also have what's called wildlife damage management. Now, wildlife damage management is very interesting. If you ever heard of a feral swine, well, you've probably heard something about wildlife damage because those guys can do some damage, all right? And then we talk about animal care or animal welfare. You know, if someone treats an animal incorrectly, we just, you know, talk about horses and uh, how, you know, people might bring their animal from another uh, country. Is it gonna be safe? And if it is safe, what kind of things are in place to keep them safe? And then of course, we deal with international trade, global trade. And you know, that's a huge market. Of course, we deal with you know, businesses in other countries that are serving us, you know, fruits, vegetables, and all types of other things. And so we have someone here that's gonna talk about our international trade or international services. And then something that is really, really on the rise all over across the globe is biotechnology. Biotechnology is that thing that's helping us grow crops a better way, grow them more safe, and making sure they're healthy and nutritious. Now, we are located in over 50, in 50 states, of course, but also not only the 50 states, but four territories. Then, of course, 35 countries. And in the 35 countries, I can tell you, it's almost like having a blanket all the way across the United States and the world. So today I have some panelists that's gonna to talk to you about some things and uh, they're gonna talk about what drives them, what drives us, why they chose to work with us, why this is the place that they decided to participate in helping us be healthy and profitable and feed and close the world. So without further ado, I'm gonna go back to one part of this and I'm gonna call on someone from the plant health area and that is Ms. Camille Morris, if you can come online and tell us a little bit about who you are, what your role is, your unit, and your mission. Hello, everyone. My name is Camille Morris, and I'm the Supervisory Outreach and Recruitment Coordinator for the Plant Protection and Quarantine Program, better known as PPQ. Our mission is to safeguard U.S. agriculture and natural resources against the entry, establishment, and spread of economically and environmentally significant pests and we facilitate safe trade to ensure there's a safe food supply for the American public. Thank you so much, Ms. Camille. And um, the next area you see is animal health. Now, when your animal is not healthy, that's not a good deal. But 
there is someone here to make sure that not only is it good for you, but is it good for us? When you see something happening with the animals, we need to call on Dr. Brian Campbell. Dr. Brian Campbell, can you come and share the same information with us? Greetings, Manners 2021. My name is Brian Campbell. I am a biologic specialist in the Inspection and Compliance Unit of the Center for Veterinary Biologics. At the Center for Veterinary Biologics, we implement the provisions of the Virus Serum Toxin Act to assure that pure, safe, potent, and effective veterinary biologics, think vaccines, are available for the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of animal diseases. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. And you know, uh, it's just a, it's a, it's so much happening right now when it even comes to this treatment of uh, animals. Cause I mean, we find ourselves in a, in a place too, where we must make sure that we're safe, right? So we have uh, no one here today for wildlife damage and management, but I will say we're gonna move to the next category, which is our animal care or animal welfare. And today we have Dr. Simone, Thomason. Dr. S Thomason, could you come on and tell us a little bit about yourself as well, your role, your unit, and your mission? Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Simone Thomason. I'm a veterinary medical officer with animal care, and my main role or duty with animal care is to make sure we ensure the humane treatment of animals that are covered by the Animal Welfare Act. And what I do is I conduct unannounced inspections at these types of facilities. But on a bigger note, we also help enforce the Horse Protection Act, where we go to horse competitions and make sure that soaring isn't going on at these competitions. And we also provide assistance during natural disasters and make sure that animals and other pets are being treated safely. That is amazing. You know, I heard about how we even go to the zoos and make sure that the seals are not having, you know, to look up into the sun to get their food. You know, no one really thinks about that when we go to see, you know, someone at sea, uh, see uh, animals at SeaWorld, but we have to pick, make, make sure that they're treated right, they're taken care of, and things, um, you know, are, are up to par. So thank you so much, Dr. Tomlinson, because that's really, really, really important. And it's not just about our uh, cats and dogs, but it's all the animals that we have, including those horses. So thank you so much. For, for taking care of that. Next, we're gonna talk about that global trade, international services. That's right, we're international, everyone. So you might be thinking about a career that's out of the United States and you wanna to go to another country. I have a friend right now working in Dubai, part of agriculture, all right? And um, you know, there's a lot to be said about that, but the person who is here to talk about that with a lot of zest and fervor is Dr. Langston Hull. Dr. Hull, could you talk to us about you and what your role is here, as well as what unit you represent and your mission? I certainly can, thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Langston Hull. I'm a veterinarian and a scientist, and the program unit that I work for is International Services. The role of International Services is to ensure that agriculture, not just in the United States, but around the globe, remains healthy and prosperous for many, many generations to come. We make our decisions based upon science, and I am the scientific technical director in international services. The science policy that I set is used to make the decision that carry out the APHIS mission across the globe in the many countries and regions that we serve through our foreign service. Thank you. That is so amazing. You know, uh, so many people don't even think about us being global when they think about they you know I, I hear people all the time it's like you guys are the ones that grade the eggs right <laughs> and I was like well we do a lot more than that but I really appreciate you sharing that information Dr. Hull and then not last but not least of course is biotechnology we have Miss Samantha Greer here today and she's going to share a little bit about what she does here and uh, her role her and her mission of course what unit so if you can come on Miss Samantha let us know a little Hi, bit more. Hi, everybody. I'm Samantha Greer. I'm a biological scientist with Biotechnology Regulatory Services. I'm in the Regulatory Operations Program. BRS regulates genetically engineered material that may pose a risk to plant health. My role is to ensure compliance for researchers who grow plants under APHIS regulations by conducting inspections, responding to non-compliance incidents, and overseeing compliance reports submitted with connection to notifications and permits. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Samantha. And again, you guys, biotechnology is on the rise. There's so much going on in that area. So when you finish your degree, or even if you're in the middle of your degree, remember, we are going to be looking for you to find a career with us, USDA APHIS. And of course, I'm going to share this at the end of the presentation. But if you're looking for a way to get in, there's an opportunity with some of our um, college programs, we have internships. And these are internships that are pretty robust. So, you know, we're going to be inviting you to come over to our table and take a look at what we're doing. But before we get there, I have about three more or two more questions I'm going to ask the panel. And I'm going to go in a round robin kind of fashion, just as we did just now. But I'm not going to call right in, you know, right back to back in the same order. But I'm going to go to Dr. Langston Hull, because I would like to Dr. Dr. Hull to tell us, what do you love about the work that you do here at USDA APHIS? Wow, that's an amazing question. Um, what I love about what we do at USDA APHIS is that we truly protect American agriculture. We make sure that the animals and the plants that provide our food every day, and not just our food, but we actually can feed the world. We're that amazing a country and we have that capacity. And USDA APHIS plays an important role in making sure that that food is safe and that we keep plant pests and diseases and animal diseases out of the country. That is amazing. And you know, I, I remember uh, seeing a sign that said, don't pack a pest. And I think I was at the beach and I came home and I was like, how did you get here? And I had a little something from the beach that came in my, my shoe. So just as it does that, you guys, we have to protect our borders from when people travel in and out of the country. And this is one of the things that happens, right? So um, let's hear from Samantha. Samantha, the same question. What, what is it about this place? What do you love about the work that you do for APHIS or with APHIS? Um, the best part of my job is knowing that I'm making a difference. I know it's cliche, but I feel like I'm making a difference and my work is important. Um, being an inspector, I get to have one-on-one -on -one interaction with our stakeholders. Um, who are working with genetically engineered material. I'm able to answer questions pertaining to the planted field trials and help the stakeholders in any way possible. I'm also able to keep up to date with technology, with using ESRI ArcGIS mapping and other software to ensure compliance for our stakeholders. That sounds phenomenal. I got a second question for you. What do you want people to know about the work that you do? Because that sounds like it's pretty, pretty intense. Could you tell us a little bit more about what, why, you know, what it is that they need to know about the work that you do there? Um, I, I want people to know that, you know, biotechnology kind of has a bad connotation, but it's not bad. Um, we, re we do work with field trials, so nothing is in market yet. Um, but it's a lot of neat research, a lot of great science, um, and just being able to physically go out in the field and see the crops that are planted and the potential to possibly feed America and the world is, is great. That sounds great. Thank you so much for sharing that information. I'm going back to another question we asked earlier to Dr. Uh, Dr. Simone. Dr. Simone, I'm going to ask you, what is it about the work that you do that you love? What, what is it that you love about the work that you do here at APHIS? Well, being an animal care veterinary medical officer of VMO, we really just get to be an advocate for the folk, for the animals that cannot speak for themselves. So being a chance to actually go and inspect and making sure that they have the humane treatment that they are needed and are necessary for them to thrive under the Animal Welfare Act is a great thing. And then also on a personal note, it's just something different every day. I, one day I can be inspecting 300 chimpanzees, the next day I can be at a laboratory with, with thousands of um, other animals. So it's just so different. It, the, the work is great and it's just a great opportunity to really see what we do um, as we, we help these animals throughout the country. Yeah, you know, it's something you just said, you know, they can't speak for themselves. And uh, it's so interesting that some people think that they can speak for the animal, but the reality is we have to be the voices, right? To go there and set the groundwork and set things straight. So thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Brian uh, Campbell, could you also answer that question? Thank you, excellent question. I've always been in love with the idea of public service and being a servant leader. 
I've always had a passion for agriculture, veterinary science, and agricultural sciences in general. I grew up actually near the Beltsville Area Research Center, and I used to pass it all the time with my parents on the Beltway. And I, it just made sense to me to find a way to get my foot in the door to work there. And it, it, like everybody else has said so far, just the passion for being the change that you want to see and knowing that your mission is critical to ensuring the health of American agriculture, it's truly humbling and an honor to work for this agency. Thank you. That's awesome. You, you, you quoted Gandhi there, right? <laughs> Be the change that you want to see. And that's very important. You know, and it's interesting that you were driving by seeing this place that you were like, you know, one day I'm going to work there. And now you are doing the work that you're doing there. One of the other things that you talked about before uh, we came on the air or came on to, to do this is the scientific lab that you work with. Could you go a little deeper and talk about your relationship with the scientific lab facility and how they work and what you know their mission and things of that nature? Yes, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit more about the diagnostics and biologics program. My, my area in the diagnostics and biologics program is the Center for Veterinary Biologics. I work on a campus called the National Centers for Animal Health and it's composed of three co-located facilities. The first is the National Animal Disease Center. They conduct basic and applied research on selected diseases of economic importance to the United States livestock and poultry industries. The second facility is the National Veterinary Services Laboratory. They safeguard US animal health and contribute to public health by ensuring that timely and accurate laboratory support is provided by their nationwide animal health diagnostic system. And to repeat, the mission of the Center for Veterinary Biologics, or CVB, is to implement the provisions of the Virus Serum Toxin Act and to assure that pure, safe, potent, and effective veterinary biologics are available for the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of animal diseases. We also have the FADL Laboratory, which is the Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostics Laboratory. They're composed of two sections, the Diagnostic Services section with the ability to diagnose more than 30 exotic animal diseases. And there's also the Reagents and Vaccine Services section. They provide diagnostic reagents, assays, vaccines, and other services for the identification, control, and eradication of foreign animal diseases. And last but certainly not least is NBAF. It's, being, it's currently being stood up. It's located in Manhattan, Kansas, but it stands for the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility. It's a new biocontainment laboratory facility that will develop vaccines, perform diagnostics, develop countermeasures against foreign animal diseases, and develop countermeasures against zoonotic diseases, otherwise known as diseases that can um, infect animals and humans. Thank you. Hmm. Wow, that's a that's a serious thing right there because of what we're dealing with even now, right? Because of how it can transfer from an animal to a human. So we have to keep those things at bay and definitely find a way to eradicate them when they show up. And this is so powerful. That was a lot of information there, Dr. Campbell. I I I gotta ask this question, and this is not on the list, but when you started to work for the department, was this where you thought you would land 100% or did it just expand more with the knowledge that you gained and the fact that you were working in this field? What, what, what was the catalyst that you, you know, you, cause you're doing so much now with the work that you do? Well, thank you. It's, um, it's truly humbling to sit here with my peers and cohort and share about the USDA in general. I went to Tuskegee University, graduated in 2005, and I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. I realized that there was a significant cost barrier associated with becoming a veterinarian, so I ended up going to graduate school at Iowa State University and getting a PhD. While I was there, I knew that I wanted to work for USDA, and we happened to have the National Centers for Animal Health located in Ames, Iowa, that works very closely with Iowa State. It took a while for me to get my foot in the door, and I've had a few different jobs along the way, but ultimately, I try to stay fresh and do something different every 18 to 24 months, and we've had a, I've been very fortunate that I've been given the opportunities to work in a lab, work in the field, work in the office, work with bio, 
veterinary biologic establishment. So I actually go out and travel similar to Samantha and Simone and inspect these facilities to make sure they are in compliance. I'm basically living my best life and it's been a lot of fun. And no, I did not imagine I would be doing this. I just knew that somehow, some way, I would be involved with the USDA and I've enjoyed this adventure and I, I enjoy everything that will come out of it. And I also enjoy sharing with those and giving back and mentoring, which is also a major part of what we do at USDA. We try to lift as we climb. So it, it just makes sense and it's very enjoyable. Thank you. Love it, love it, love it. Lift as we climb. If you haven't heard that, you need to say that and put that on your wall. <laughs> lift as you climb. Don't just think about yourself, but you're thinking about pulling somebody along with you. I, I got to go to Dr. Langston on this because international service, you're all over the world. We're doing stuff out of the border. How did you find that you were going to be in that space? And, 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 and what was your journey like? Um, yes, thanks for the for the question. So my journey started off very, very young. I'm a fifth generation farmer from Louisiana, um, primarily sugarcane. Always knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. I was the young child that always brought a stray turtle home from the bayou or a stray dog or a stray cat. Ended up going to veterinary school at Louisiana State University and then decided that I not only wanted to be a doctor of veterinary medicine, but I was also very interested in science. So I earned a PhD in basically infectious diseases. Um, I started off in the um, agency as an imports veterinary medical officer. So I was basically in charge of making sure that animals that came into the country were free of disease. From there, mm -hmm. I became director of the Cattle Health Commodity Center so I made sure that the cattle and bison herds in the United States remained free of disease. And then I was introduced to international services and my eyes were really open. And I really wanna to talk to you all about the foreign service. A lot of us think that there are careers, say in the military, where you get to see the world. Well, APHIS International Services is another place to be able to see the world. We're in so many different countries and the role we play there is basically, if we can help those countries and those regions to control animal diseases and plant diseases and pests there, then when they send products to our country, we can be doubly sure that those plants and animals and plant and animal products are free of disease. It's a great way to see the world. Earlier, I was on a call with some of my colleagues. We had colleagues on from North Asia, South Asia, Europe, the Caribbean. We're all over the world. Talk about travel. Our passports are always in use. We get to see different parts of the world and we definitely are able by seeing those parts of the world and talking to our trading partners, we're able to make sure that our food supply stays safe but we're also able to help their food supplies to stay safe. And that's why I said earlier that we not only feed our great country, but we feed the world. That is phenomenal. And you know, it's so interesting because I'm a military veteran myself. And I remember thinking about like, where did I want to go? That was one of the reasons why I joined the military. I was like, okay, I, I know I'm not going to get there from my little town, but if I get into this, I can get an opportunity. And you said, hey, don't even, not to just think about the military, but look, foreign agricultural services, you can be in a place where you're actually impacting the world from some small place like Peru, you know, or on, on an island somewhere where, you, you know, when you're off time, you, you can hit the beach. So it's quite interesting. And then, of course, I have a friend, she was uh, over in China doing a, a, a lot of work uh, at the borders and things of that nature. And that was pretty interesting. So, you know, this is phenomenal. And I think, again, you guys that are watching this, young people, uh, college students, if you're looking at your degree and you're trying to figure out where do you want to go, what you heard people say is they, they didn't quite know this was where they were going to land. It was like a lattice, right? You get in and then you start moving and you start giving yourself an opportunity. Dr. Brian said that he changes uh, every uh, 18 to 24 months. He's making a move. He's looking for another opportunity to learn more. So I got to hear from Ms. Camille because Camille, you and I have crossed paths a lot since we started here at USDA APHIS in my five years. Talk about your how, you, how did you land to where you are right now? Well, I began in uh, California 
as an animal health aid for veterinary services during the big ostrich industry where people thought that people would stop eating chicken and, eat, and start eating ostrich. It didn't happen. Um, the industry fell apart. So I became a plant protection quarantine officer in Long Beach, California. I did that for approximately five years. And then from there, I moved to Los Angeles International Airport to become a canine officer. Mm. I did that for one year. Then I heard that there was going to be a new program called the Smuggling Interdiction Trade Compliance Program. I wanted to be there in the beginning of the program so I could develop the policies and make a big impact on the program. CITSI is focused on the, if you want to find a smuggler, you have to think like a smuggler. So it allowed me to put my creativity and innovation skills to use, something I'm very passionate about. There was a quote, uh, I began in Miami in that position, and then uh, a position opened up in Raleigh, North Carolina. I became the regional program manager and eventually the director of the program. After serving for like five years, my head director um, asked me to try a position as the outreach and recruitment coordinator because she said she saw something within me, seeing the potential within me. And she allowed me to serve in this capacity um, for a one year time period. After one year, I told her I didn't wanna go back to my former position because I saw that I could be really effective helping students and recent graduates with fulfilling their goals um, as far as, and I also enjoyed the opportunity to be able to educate them about career opportunities to raise this. So 27 years later, I can honestly say that I'm in the best position throughout the agency. I love what I do, um, especially when I get to participate in events like this, such as Manners. Wow. I thought you just started. I didn't know 27. <laughs> That's all right. You know what? Here's something you said that I think people need to hear. Think like a smuggler. Right? Yeah. Think like a smuggler. You had to put yourself in their shoes and try to see, okay, what are the things that we need to do? I don't think anybody in college is thinking about like, hey, who smuggles plants? Who smuggles bugs? Who smuggles, you know, uh, I, I just saw a cartoon and the guy had smuggled in a, a certain bird that he wanted to have, you know, and it was an exotic bird. So people do smuggle certain things. So pretty cool. Uh, uh, again, you guys hear it. She didn't go like the ladder. She went on the lattice, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to ask <laughs> Dr. Simone Thomason if you could say a little bit about how your career has and how you landed where you are too. Okay, well, like some of the students that are watching this um, program in the future, they are part of the 1890 Scholars Program, and that's the program that kind of landed me my position here with USDA. Um, I'm an 1890 Scholars alumni. I went to Maryland Eastern Shore for the program and then went on to vet school at Tuskegee. And as an agreement with the program, you have to kind of work or give back the years that they pay for your scholarship. So I ended up with animal care. And honestly, prior to all this, I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. Growing up in Queens, New York, the only kind of veterinarian you're familiar with are your typical small animal vets. So the world of government veterinarians was just a huge eye opener once I came on board. And just having this opportunity to work and, and being able to go throughout the field all through up and down the East Coast to see how these different veterinarians work in their states definitely gave me an idea of what I wanted to do with my career. And I'm very happy to be here. And I've been to VMO down here in New Orleans, which is some people think is a culture shock, but it's almost kind of similar in how we act down here versus New York. And I'm enjoying it down here, doing my job, you know, and, you know, enforcing the Animal Welfare Act. And, been doing it now for about six years and it's a great opportunity. It sounds like you found this area that you 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 had no you knew it was something, but you didn't know that's what it was, but you found it and it's it's really served you well. Uh, thank you for sharing that information. And you know, I like the fact that you mentioned the 1890 scholars program, the, the scholarship program. And what you said is that they actually you had to give back years after you completed that. So again, students, uh, people watching this, if you are thinking about how can you, you know, get your degree, this, insur this internship may be the best option for you. So don't forget to go to our table and uh, check it out and just talk to us about the career options there and the, the uh, educational career options there. Okay, I got to get to Samantha. I know, Samantha, you've been waiting. You've been over there like, did he, did he miss me? He's not so far away. <laughs> but Samantha, go ahead and share. How did you land where you are? And I mean, biotechnology is huge. What is it, you know, that, that got you to that point? Um, my journey, it has been pretty much all over the place. I started as a student um, while I was enrolled in North Carolina State University. Um, 
and I applied through the, their career development uh, center. Um, and upon graduation, there were positions becoming available within animal care. And my then supervisor was like, hey, we got some positions coming up. Can you apply? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm graduating. I'm going to need a job. So please. <laughs> so I applied. I started off as a, a inspection and licensing assistant with animal care. And then I moved um, to BRS a few years later. Um, and I was doing administrative work first with BRS and now I'm in my role as a biological scientist inspector now. And I've been in this role for four years, but a total with APHIS for 14 years. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. And again, sharing how you've made it to that place. And we've heard from everyone on the panel. I have one more question. I believe our time is getting short and I wanna make sure I get this question in before uh, we, we get to the end. There's usually a book that you would say, hey, I'm, I read this book or there was a uh, blog that you read or there was something that impacted you that helped you uh, see the possibilities. If you could think about that one thing that you would tell a college student to do as they're preparing for their career and moving forward for their career, especially a career with USDA APHIS, is there any kind of book or video or movie that you would say, hey, you know what, Check a look, take a look at this and, and, and see what's happening. I remember uh, watching a movie with Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin had autism. And I used to work for the, uh, the I used to do work with the Department of um, uh, Disabilities. And uh, we talked about how she looked at innovating the, 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 the houses for um, where we uh, take our, uh, our, our, our cows. And so she, she looked at how they were originally being, you know, herded into a space for sale. And she decided to create this other option for them to, to go to sale. So, you know, you never know where it's going to take you. You never know what's going to happen. But what's that one thing that uh, you would say to them, hey, pay attention to this. And this might give you some insight about the careers where we protect the health and, 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 uh, and value of our American uh agriculture and natural resources. Can I'm going to start with the plant health and go all the way across. So Camille, you'll be first, then Mr. Brian, Dr. Brian, you'll be next. Okay. Well, one opportunity I had was to go to um, Hawaii to film an outreach video to discourage passengers from bringing agri agricultural products back from the mainland to the United States or to, I'm sorry, from Hawaii to the mainland. And when I what, worked on the video, I didn't anticipate the impact where a lot of the tour buses started showing it. So, and other people who were touring Hawaii and just knowing the effectiveness this had to, in order to protect American agriculture, um, this one video really inspired me. And, you know, that's why I love my position because I had the same opportunity to go do the same thing in Puerto Rico and film a video, discourage passengers from bringing um, products back to the mainland. So I just feel that a lot of my work has been really effective in our mission to protect the agriculture for the American public. Awesome, thank you so much. Dr. Brian Campbell. Um, two things. First is a question that was posed to me by Dr. Langston Hall back in 2015. How do you stand out in a room full of type A personalities? <laughs> I, I, I had no idea how to answer the question at the time. So thankfully Langston answered it for me. You have to be assertive and aggressive without being annoying. More importantly, you have to know your target audience to understand those fine nuances. As far as books are concerned and literature that I would recommend, I would recommend that everybody check out the book called Crucial Conversations. At some point in your life, if you have not experienced adversity, I guarantee that you will, and how you handle yourself in those situations can make or break your trajectory. So please check out crucial conversations if you have a chance. Thank you. All right, so much. That's a real powerful book, powerful course that, that we teach here at Center for Training and Organizational Development as well. And so uh, animal care or animal welfare, uh, Dr. Simone Thomason. I think really the main opportunity is don't be afraid to speak. Speak, you know, speak and network. Honestly, I know Manners, I'm, I've been to many Manners conferences, um, both in undergrad and in going through with vet school. And even in this virtual format, it's always an opportunity just to shoot an email, shoot a DM, DM 
there's someone that there's something that you're interested in because honestly, as you can see with APHIS, there's literally a position for anything you can dream of. And that's just kind of the way to get your foot in the door and to make, you know, make a difference. And that one email can lead you to a career opportunity. So that's just really what I want to leave you guys with today. That's awesome. All right. So um, Dr. Langston Hill. Ho. Um, yes, I, I think that um, I would just kind of rely on two sayings that I sort of live by. Um, the first is our greatest fear is not that we're inadequate, it's that we're powerful beyond measure. So I would just encourage everyone to fully be yourself, be confident in yourself, don't limit your future, the sky's the limit, surround yourself with positive people, don't be afraid to speak up, don't be afraid to stand out. I was the nerd. Um, I was the guy who was always studying, but what you understand is you can do that and be cool and be accepted as well. But sometimes being that nerd just means that later on, you're gonna be the cool kid's boss. So <laughs> do that. The second I think is understanding that you don't need to be afraid of what's called failure. Some people call that just an opportunity to learn because all failure is, is one of two outcomes of trying. So always try. And if you don't succeed the first time, keep trying. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who was talking about um, the invention of the light bulb. He was basically asked, how does it feel to have failed 10,000 times to create a light bulb? His response was, I really didn't fail. I just learned 10,000 ways to not create a light bulb. And it only took that one time to figure out how to actually do it. Thank you. Powerful, powerful, powerful wow. words. And Ms. Samantha. Um, one thing that I would recommend is to step out of your comfort zone. Um, with y'all being a part of the Manners Conference Manners, um, having the ability to take advantage of uh, opportunities that can come arise and shadowing opportunities. If you network with people through the career fair, you can shadow. Um, I know with APHIS, we have uh, details that we're able to participate in, any leadership development programs that you can participate in. Um, but I do like the book, The Seven Habits, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, if you all could read that. That's an awesome book, Stephen Covey. So I want to say thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to give you like two, not even 1% of the amazing work that we do at the Department of Agriculture, APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Remember that we're protecting America's agriculture, natural resources. We're keeping the food safe. We're keeping the place safe. We're helping the planet, right? So we're looking forward for you to come over to our booth where you'll get to discuss some of the different ways. You know, you heard today about the, the uh, 1890 scholarship and there's so many other scholarships that you may be qualified for that someone will be able to uh, share some information with you. And so don't forget, just come over to the booth and then, you know, look at these jobs. You may have a hard time figuring out some of the job titles. So come over to the booth and allow us to help give you some uh, information. So if you go on a USA Jobs, you kind of get lost in there, we can help you find your way. All right. So I want to say thank, thank you to the panel and the panelists for uh, coming here today to share information for minorities in agriculture and natural resources, and of course, our uh, related uh, sciences. And then, of course, I want to say thank you for taking the time to watch this and then we look forward to helping you craft out what you want in your world when it comes to your career. Look forward to talking to you soon. I'm gonna turn this back over to our host and I'm gonna stop sharing right here and uh, we can go from there.